Welcome to our lecture series on the ecological crisis in Eastern Europe. Um, today's lecture is, um, as you know, an uh, EPV lecture, so a lecture of the Department of Political Science. That's why I want uh, especially to also welcome people who join the lecture today for the talk with um, Natalia Momonova, whom we are going to hear in a minute. My name is Christina Planck. I'm currently visiting professor for Eastern European Studies at the Department of Political Science, and I will moderate the session. And before we start, I just want to give you some technical details. So if you enter the room with using the microphone, as um, most of the students usually do, please don't forget to mute yourself when you're in the room. And the second technical detail is that we are going to record this lecture today because it's an EPV lecture. Uh, I'm very happy that Natalia Mamonova is with us today and that she will talk about populism, neoliberalism and sustainable alternatives in rural Europe. And before she will use the next, let's say, maximum 60 minutes, um, I'm going to present her just very briefly. Natalia is a postdoctoral researcher at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, and she's also the principal coordinator of the European team of the Emancipatory Rural Politics Initiatives. She holds a PhD from Erasmus University in the Netherlands, and her research focuses on, as we will also hear today, populism, food sovereignty and agrarian movements in rural Europe, where she in particular focuses on Eastern Europe and on countries of the former Soviet Union. Natalia is now in Sweden, but she has also been a visiting researcher and a lecturer at other institutions, such as the University of Oxford or the New Europe College in Bucharest. And she's also been to Helsinki University. So with this, um, I'm happy that we will have now the chance to listen to your talk today, Natalia. And yeah, I'll hand over uh, to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Uh, well, thank you for hosting me here. And as Christina already mentioned, uh, we will talk today about the populism in the countryside uh, of post-socialist uh, Eastern and Central Europe. So we'll talk about the uh, Europe in general, but with particular focus on Eastern Europe, as it's also a point of interest for many of you here. And uh, some of you have read the articles which I've sent. Uh, also, maybe watch the video lecture. Uh, uh, it will be a good base for the lecture today. But, but some people have joined us and who are not the students anymore and who don't have the access to this material. So I will uh, start with some uh, general things that you might have, some of you might have read or watched uh, for this class, and, uh, but I'll try not to repeat myself and not to make you bored. Um, one more uh, big thank uh, to all of you for uh, sending me the questions. They are very great and they are very challenging as well. Many uh, thinkers and activists were struggling and are struggling uh, with uh, these questions as well. So I will try to address the, most of them get in my lecture. If I don't cover all of those uh, questions that you asked and you have, we'll discuss it later uh, during the discussion time. Uh, so let's start. And uh, next slide. Yeah. So uh, just uh, briefly uh, to tell you the structure of my talk today, I will uh, discuss four main topics. First is the relations between populism and the countryside. Uh, second is a crisis of neoliberalism as a cause of right-wing populism in Europe and globally. Uh, then also we'll talk about some common trends in Eastern and Central Europe and give you some examples from different countries, which you might find interesting. And also I'll finish with the word, some words on sustainable alternative and food sovereignty as one of those. And we'll talk about uh, some uh, pros and cons of this approach. So, but before we uh, begin, uh, let's uh, give a definition of populism so that we are all on a common ground. And uh, there are hundreds of definitions of this phenomenon and none of them is perfect. 
Uh, some scholars understand populism as an ideology, others as a political movement or discursive frame. Uh, but what is essential in populism is the idea of the people who are juxtaposed against the evil, unfairly advantaged others, often elites or minority groups. Um, so here you can see the, the definition that was used by John Boris in his paper. And I think it's covering uh, quite well uh, this uh, populist issue. Uh, but what is the connection between populism and the countryside? Uh, let's look uh, briefly into the history. Uh, first, populists were Narodniks, the political movement of Russian intelligentsia during the 19th century. Narodniks aimed uh, to mobilize peasants against elites. They wanted to overthrow the monarchy and create a socialist society based on the principles of peasant commune. Uh, also, the peasant or agrarian populism inspired the foundation of the People's Party in the United States in the 1890s. And it also was uh, popular in Central and Eastern Europe during the interwar period. Then radical uh, political parties representing the interest of peasants, they held their power in Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, uh, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. Uh, this period was known as the Green Rising and was characterized by the ideological and political struggles between fascism, communism, and capitalism. And uh, talking about fascism, uh, you might uh, not know, but both uh, Mussolini and Hitler won their first mass following in rural, uh, rural areas. So we should take uh, this issue very serious. Um, uh, contemporary European populism, populists sorry, are certainly not fascists, even so some might compare one to another. Uh, the primary difference is that uh, fascism was oriented towards the future and European right-wing populists are oriented towards the past or more precisely towards an idealized notion of the past. They aim to restore the status quo in their homelands and uh, return the national glory, which was presumably lost due to the activities of others, uh, the others, uh, the others as migrants, minorities, uh, cosmopolitan elites, the European Union, and, and many more. Um, and we uh, can see these days that populist message uh, became very popular in many rural areas of Europe and especially in Eastern and Central Europe, where populist parties and authoritarian leaders get into power and form the government. And this happened often with an electoral support of rural voters. So it's important to understand uh, why the rural dwellers uh, support populists and not to look at them as a naive uh, people who don't understand what they vote for, uh, but try to see their fundamental problem behind that a rebellious vote for populists. Uh, in contemporary mainstream debates, right-wing populism is portrayed as a result of economic and cultural crisis uh, that hit Europe during the last decade. Indeed, the uh, global financial crisis and Eurozone crisis uh, have exacerbated economic inequality in rural Europe, which influenced the villagers' support for populist parties. Uh, in the same way, the fears of losing cultural identity due to globalization, multiculturalism and the refugee crisis made many people vote for populists. However, this argument did not show the, the entire picture and it cannot explain some uh, fundamental paradoxes of populist rise to power. And in the next slide, you can see those paradoxes. Here it is. Uh, so look at these three maps. On their first map, you uh, see the electoral support for right-wing parties. The uh, dark blue means the highest support. The second map, map shows the amount of asylum seekers in 2018. Uh, likewise, the darker color is the largest share. And in a third map, uh, you can see the GDP growth, and the blue color means uh, negative, and red means positive growth. Uh, you can see that uh, those countries that have the least migrants and are better off have the strongest support for right-wing populists. So if we want to understand the spread of right-wing populism, we need to go beyond the dichotomy between cultural and economic factors and find a deeper systematic trigger. I'm trying to change. Yes. Um, 
So uh, together with my colleagues from uh, Emancipatory Rural Politics Initiative, we've done a research on right-wing populism in rural Europe. Uh, we just recently finished it, and it resulted in a special issue published in Sociology Ruris. If you're interested, you can Google it. Uh, so the study uh, has covered various regions of Europe, uh, both North, North and South Europe, West and East. And by analyzing different uh, case studies, we uh, wanted to demonstrate, and we did, that the cause of right-wing populism in Europe and in the world as well, is the fundamental crisis of globalized neoliberal capitalism. The, uh, yes, um, yeah, so uh, neoliberal capitalism has fundamentally transformed the rural Europe, right, uh, in terms of agricultural production and rural lifestyle. Uh, it's uh, in what if you're talking about the countryside, this is a modernization paradigm that dominated and still dominates in the European Union rural development policies. And it also pre largely predefines their common agricultural policy objectives. Uh, it was aimed to modernize those traditional farmers and thereby to give the boost to economic development. Um, it did bring some positive results, but at the same time, it resulted in expansion of a large uh, industrial agribusiness at the expense of small scale family farmers. And also it led to the emergence of the so-called food empires that spread its monopolistic power over the entire food chain. Let me show you a few diagrams. Um, some of them you might have seen already in a video lecture, but let's, let's go through them very briefly. Here it is, there is a uh, land concentration in Europe, and uh, you can see that 3% of European farms now in Western Europe now own 52% um, of agricultural land. And also what you see also in the uh, uh, Eastern uh, part of the Europe is about 75% of small farms are left with just 11% of land. Uh, many farmers found themselves trapped in the supermarket driven the value chain and a tight dependency on banks and retailers. They either have to expand and become industrial, industrial food producers, or unfortunately they get bankrupt and disappear. The European Union Common Agricultural Policy, which I already mentioned that is based on the modernization paradigm, is designed to support various food producers, both large and small. But in fact, most of the farm subsidies go to the large business. And on the next slide, uh, you can see here on in the right uh, bottom uh, corner, uh, you can see the top uh, beneficiaries of the common agriculture policy in 2009. Well, it's a little bit updated, but you can still see that uh, the large multinational corporations received a lot of farm subsidies. In result, uh, many uh, small-scale food producers become marginalized and disappeared. Uh, see the other diagram uh, here that the data uh, taken from European Commission for Agriculture and Rural Development report. Uh, so you see the loss of agricultural jobs by country during the last decade. Most of these jobs were at the small-scale farms. Uh, and and you, you may see it's a little numbers, but you may still see that, for example, it's more than 900,000 farms disappeared in Romania, 600,000 in Poland, about 300,000 in Bulgaria, just, just there's a huge amount of farms. And in total, uh, the number of full-time farmers across the EU fell by over one third, representing 5 million jobs. Uh, in one of the questions that you sent to me in advance, you asked me if there's neoliberal uh, economy is the only reason for the support of right-wing populists. Uh, no, it's not, because neoliberalism affected not only the system of production uh, in our world, but many more. It impacted values, it impacted culture, it impacted politics. Uh, let me give you a few examples. I won't be able to cover all the spectrum of their uh, neoliberal developments. Um, but, uh, for example, the economic uh, de-agrarianization entailed uh, also a cultural de-agrarianization. Uh, it's a loss of interest in agriculture and rural lifestyle. Uh, 
This leads to a decreased social understanding of farm processes and triggers various conflicts between farmers and society. Uh, you know, there uh, people complain that farms, there's a, it smells or it's, uh, I don't know, uh, produce some sound and there's a lot of complaint that in the past was a normal uh, sound and smell of the countryside. Now it's in the, uh, their triggers some frustrations. And also uh, the farmers are often blamed for climate change, for greenhouse gas emissions and so on. So that's also rise there some social conflicts and related to lifestyle and in this case also environmental. Uh, also, the uh, neoliberal ideology is based on three principles, individualism, competition and consumption. And these principles change the countryside significantly. The uh, individualization of society limits the propensity for a collective um, action. And, uh, you know, for, in order to uh, represent the interests of rural uh, communities, you need to have the strong uh, social, civil society, right? So, and if people can't uh, unite, it's a big problem. So, the same uh, impact has a competition uh, that uh, prevents any collective action. But uh, let me uh, tell you a few words on the consumerism, which is a very interesting uh, phenomenon, and its impact has a huge impact on rural lifestyle, especially in countries of northern and western Europe, where the majority of rural inhabitants are not engaged in fruit production, right? So, it's even called sort of the consumption uh, countryside. Some authors argue that the consumerism contributes to the success of right-wing populists in Europe. In consumerist societies, uh, economic capital is important for maintaining social identities, while personal uh, success or failure are measured in employment and welfare benefits. Uh, so in a crisis or in a, in a worsening economic condition, when people are not able to live up to the silent uh, social identities and their con uh, con uh, constructed values, they experience low self-esteem, low self-esteem, esteem, 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 sorry, uh, their shame and uh, insecurity. Uh, these negative emotions are channeled into the anger and resentment towards perceived enemies. And in this case, the uh, migrants, minorities, elites, and elected bureaucrats in Brussels, and so on. So uh, I just want to uh, illustrate to you that there is much more than just economic impact of neoliberalism. Uh, another, like talking about the questions you uh, raised uh, uh, for this uh, lecture, is another question is you ask about xenophobia, sexism, racism, and many other uh, big serious problems that are often discussed at the causes of their support for populist, uh, right-wing populist parties. And it's indeed very relevant. And I won't be able to cover those topics uh, in this lecture because it uh, requires an additional hour to talk about it. But uh, let me give you an example about xenophobia and racism in uh, the countryside in the East of Eastern Europe, if you are talking about this now. So, and this are related to the neoliberal uh, transformation. And let me tell you how. Uh, so, uh, as you know, that in Eastern Europe, there are lots of problems and conflicts between, between uh, the rural residents and the Roma population, right? So, uh, in our uh, collective research that we have done, I was talking about, uh, so we had a one case study about the anti-Roma sentiments in rural town in Slovakia. It was uh, written by Daniel Škobla and Richard Filchuk. And... Uh, so did you know that in the communist time, Roma people were commonly employed as unskilled industrial workers? Um, but with the development of uh, uh, neoliberalism, many uh, industrial rural regions became the sort of losers of the globalization because the factories and manufacturers were shut down or moved to other countries. Uh, so in the result, many low-wage, low-skilled workers, uh, such as Roma people, yeah, became uh, chronically unemployed and their housing and sanitary conditions deteriorated. And this led to the further stigmatization and outcasting of these uh, minority groups. And this is also can be linked to in some way, well, maybe not directly, but indirectly to this neoliberal development. Uh -huh. So uh, the same uh, way we are talking about neoliberalism, we can't talk 
we can't uh, ignore the crisis of representative democracy that uh, is directly linked to it. And it's and again, it's not about economy, it's about politics. Uh, politics became very complex and not transparent. Uh, the mainstream centrist parties, those that determine European politics since the end of the Cold War, they created a political discourse that neoliberal globalization is the only way forward. And there's no discussion about any possible alternatives. And uh, so in such context, many people have come to believe that their government represent the interest of markets and transnational, and transnational uh, corporations, while uh, citizens' voice is unheard uh, in this regard. So this dissatisfaction with mainstream politics is very strong in the countryside. And it's not only because the politics are intransparent and there is no mainstream debates about neoliberalism, um, but it's also that um, there are some more uh, rural processes uh, that lead to this dissatisfaction. Uh, for example, and this was one of your questions as well, that many uh, political uh, parties uh, and leaders, they don't have an, any ideas what's going on in the countryside. They are uh, born in cities, they rise in cities, they don't know the, city, the rural problems and everyday life. So they, uh, even if they address urba, uh, rural problems, they don't even understand it uh, or experience it themselves. So it's very difficult to create the connection between Politi political leaders and the uh, villagers. Uh, and also, there's not so many mainstream politicians are appealed to villagers because uh, rural population is commonly perceived as a political and not very el reliable electoral group. And in addition to all this, uh, the 2008 economic crisis resulted in that in many rural municipalities, uh, there is a decrease in economic and political autonomy and the reduction of number of uh, local self-government. And this also uh, contributed to the situation when people feel that uh, they are not able to influence their decision making at the, any level of the government and that their opinion is ignored. But uh, so now let's uh, talk a little bit more specific about the Eastern European case. Yes, um, many scholars uh, link the rise of right-wing populism in post-socialist Europe to the problematic transition from socialism to capitalism. The transition was uh, accompanied by serious economic and political uh, turbulences in most of the countries. There was a hyperinflation, it was unemployment, and unemployment there was also uh, resulted in a loss of social status. Uh, these uh, negative experiences made many people believe that their Western model uh, doesn't fit well to the post-socialist realities. And um, this is well seen in the countryside. After a collapse of the uh, communism uh, in many countries, uh, the countries uh, initiated, the gar new government initiated land reforms to distribute former collective land to rural population for private farming. Uh, you probably know this this uh, transformation period, and it was the idea to create the Western time of type of family farming in Eastern Europe. Uh, yet, there um, uh, it didn't work out. The uh, commercial family farming have uh, has emerged, but at a very limited scale, and most of the land became uh, acc accumulated by industrial agribusiness, often with oligarchic oligarchic and international capital involved. Only just a few countries, for example, this Romania and Poland, they are still characterized by a large number of small farms, yet the processes of land concentration also take place there. The uh, accession of post-socialist uh, countries to the European Union uh, brought a lot of hopes to the uh, post-socialist society. It did indeed uh, um, resulted in a number of positive effects on a rural economy, such as uh, subsidies for farmers and increased income for poor households. However, the common agricultural policy, which I already uh, mentioned in the several times, uh, um, it was uh, unable to address the specificities of post-socialist agrarian structure. Uh, and in such a way, it deepened inequalities between small and large. Um, then another thing is, is the provinciality complex. Uh, the transition to the West uh, has also created this provinciality complex uh, in many countries of Eastern and Central Europe. 
post-socialist countries are often portrayed as less advanced sort of imaginary provinces of Europe and their political and economic interests are often sacrificed in favor of Western Europe. Uh, these um, experiences produce a nativist reaction in the region, a reaccession of this uh, authentic national traditions. These traditions, as we know, uh, are rooted in peasant culture and folklore. It's also we, we observe these days a lot of interest in their uh, peasant uh, clothes and uh, festivals and, and so on. And it's more uh, dominant in Eastern Europe than in the West, for example. Also, uh, research shows that uh, Eastern European populism is more authoritarian and more nationalist uh, because of the communist legacies and the struggles with redefinition of national identities. Uh, so, and there's a lot of attempts uh, in the contemporary uh, scholarship to distinguish some common trends in populism in this region. But what I would like to say today is that there is no uh, uniform characteristics. Populism takes different forms in different countries, in different regions, in different villages. And uh, now I would like to give you a few examples from different countries to uh, illustrate the diversity of populism in Eastern Europe. Here, the very interesting case from Eastern Germany. Um, so, uh, as you know, after the fall of the Berlin War, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, after the fall of Berlin Wall, uh, the Eastern Germany uh, underwent structural transformation uh, in order to uh, follow its Western counterpart in capitalist development. However, the 30 years later, the economic performance and living standards in Eastern Germany, they still remain lower than in Western Germany. Uh, rural areas of uh, Eastern Germany underwent transformation similar to other post-socialist countries. I just mentioned uh, how their former collective and state uh, companies were distributed to small scale for farming, but didn't work out. Just a few families uh, were able to reclaim the land in Eastern Germany and organize private farms. In most cases, the collective lands were accumulated by former farm managers and later by non-local, non-agricultural investors, prim primarily uh, those coming from Western Germany. Also, there were uh, serious land speculations uh, that drove land prices up, which made the access to farmland for newcomers limited and expensive. In result, young, well-educated, often female villagers left the economically weak regions um, of Eastern Germany. And uh, many uh, villages became the so called zones of economic and social vacuum. Uh, however, uh, this we see there another movement there that these uh, zones of vacuum, of, in other words, the dying villages of Eastern Germany, they became attractive for the ethnic settler, settlers, uh, so called uh, Volkische Settler. Um, and in, on this picture, you can see the graffiti on a building in a small village, Yamel, in the northeast Germany. Uh, the graffiti portrays a racially poor, pure, self-sufficient peasant community of ethnic settlers. Uh, this village has uh, about 11 houses with 40 inhabitants, and most of its inhabitants are those ethnic settlers. And they follow very much the right-wing ideas of Artamans. Uh, it's an, it's a na former Nazi uh, back to the land uh, movement that was dedicated to blood and soul soil uh, inspired ruralism. These ethnic settlers buy abundant rural houses, set up organic farms and get actively involved in the revitalization of village social, cultural and economic life. And they often present themselves as, help, as helpful neighbors, as a help hard-working uh, craftspeople and very good, nice parents, and therefore they are popular in uh, villages. Um, the resistance in, uh, to this right-wing in commerce is very uncommon, and this allows the settlers to spread the ideology in rural areas without any constraints. Um, another example from Ukraine, but uh, it's an absolutely different story. Uh, here's also the discourse on dying villages and it is uh, strong in the society and it became a powerful mean in populist mobilization against uh, liberalization of the land market. It's going on these days in Ukraine. Uh, 
after the collapse of Soviet Union, Ukraine initiated land reform uh, for the same purpose uh, to uh, mimic the Western-like uh, rural development. But uh, reform. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, the reform never com was never completed, and land moratorium was set up to prevent the land concentration and land grabbing in the country. Um, however, it didn't uh, prevent the large agro holdings and domestic oligarchs in accumulating the fast areas of land. Uh, the Euro Maidan revolution, as uh, you, you may know, in, that took place in 2014, was aimed to bring the country on, back on the European path of the development and to integrate with the European Union. And then for many Ukrainians, the uh, word Europe was associated with a bad life. Then many people believed that association agreement with the EU would revitalize those dying villages and bring prosperity to its inhabitants. Uh, yet they didn't foresee how this association agreement would imply the abolition of the moratorium on land sales. Uh, the moratorium uh, has been a very political topic in Ukraine for, for many decades, but it uh, became really actual policy uh, during the President Zelensky, who started the process of land market liberalization. And this uh, triggered a massive large-scale populist mobilization uh, among both pro-European and pro-Russian populists. Uh, and their populist movements and leaders, they manipulated the social uh, fears about land grabs by foreigners and uh, disappearance of the villages uh, of Ukraine. Um, on the picture, you can see those protests very much supported by populists. And on a big uh, poster, you can see the slogan, uh, no village, no Ukraine. So without the village, there will be, the country would not exist. Uh, however, the populists do not offer any solutions to the problem. And they hardly have any rural development plan. Um, in general, in, in European populists aim to preserve and defend capitalism in the name of the people. Uh, they often criticize the transnational corporations and neoliberal globalization, but in fact, they follow exactly the same principles uh, when they come to power. And this the next slide, I give you another example. Uh, this is uh, Hungary um, in his uh, um, election campaigns, Viktor Urban expressed many times his support for family farming. Uh, for example, in 2010, he appealed to rural voters and promised to support the Hungarian countryside and small scale food producers. And this support was also central in his national uh, rural strategy. However, the support never materialized. Instead, Urban's party, Fidel's, uh, became associated with representing the interests of big companies such as Monsanto, um, oligarchs and land grabbing. And here on the uh, title of this uh, slide, I um, wrote a quote of Jean-Francois Bayard. Uh, he didn't talk about Hungary, he talked about uh, Europe in general. Uh, so he argued that populists offer liberalism for the rich and nationalism for the poor. They uh, indeed they claim to be the protectors of national identity, but at the same time they negotiate a better terms for the elite. Uh, another example, yes, that is uh, coming from uh, Poland. So, uh, and uh, what I'll say, it's not related only to, the po to Poland, uh, but to many other countries. The populists often appropriate uh, progressive discourses of left-wing movements. They often talk about env environmental sustainability, about the problems related to climate change. Uh, they support local food production and consumption uh, and so on. Uh, so all these ideas are very, uh, initially, they were very liberal, socially inclusive, very democratic. Um, however, the populists managed to portray them in a very nativist, very exclusionary way. And here, uh, talking about the climate change, I put the picture of uh, uh, peace politician Isabella Clock, who announces the establishment of the National Center for Climate Change Research. Uh, as an opposition to the European European Union climate policy that uh, she argued actually uh, ruined their environment and the climate in many parts 
of Poland. And uh, we initiated a research on uh, in that area to look whether it's really a true or not. And there's indeed serious in the environmental problems, um, but uh, how it's related to their climate policy of EU, it's not really clear. So anyway, that's here I wanted to show that uh, the populists are focused on an, on the problems within their national borders, but uh, usually in opposition to the global processes and their like pan-European institutions such as uh, European Union uh, climate policy. And another example, and this will be the final example example uh, for today, this is coming from Russia. Uh, Vladimir Putin is not populist for sure, but he's rather more authoritarian leader. Uh, but he inspired many populists around the world. Um, here um, you can see the picture from their anti-GMO uh, campaign of Russian government. In fact, in 2006, when the food sanctions actually uh, happened. Uh, uh, the Russian state Duma has passed a bill that bans the import and production of genetically modified organisms. Uh, at the same time, it's very controversial uh, bill because there's not much GMO produced and imported to Russia, especially in the context of food sanctions. Uh, so it's uh, a rather uh, populist policy to gain support among uh, urban consumers. Uh, and to show that the state cares about the health of its citizens. It also was at the same time, there were uh, banning and closure of several McDonald's uh, uh, in country. So it's all uh, part of their uh, getting uh, support uh, from their uh, voters. And now we go to uh, the sustainable alternatives. Yeah. Uh, so what has to be done in this context? Uh, so we can't uh, deal with the problem with the means that were used to create it, right? We need to have something alternative, uh, opposite. But at the same time, the top-down initiatives are not able to change uh, the, the status quo. So there's a resistance and uh, alternatives should come from below. Uh, there's a, a growing recognition among scholars and activists that populism by itself, uh, it's not a bad thing. So it's an important of um, the it's, it's a very important dimension of democracy. It gives a uh, voice to people. And uh, Sir Chantal Mofer, for example, here I uh, quote you in the first line that she argues that instead of rejecting populism, we need to reclaim it by fostering the progressive version of it, uh, the left wing version of it that puts interest of the common man and woman first uh, ahead of their priorities of wealthy global elite whose interest dominated our society for far too long. Um, and in your questions, one of those questions that you uh, sent me in advance, uh, you uh, ask a very relevant question, how left-wing populists uh, could reach out to rural voters that they do not uh, understand the, the everyday life of uh, rural communities and their struggles? And you're absolutely right. And this is a big problem of not only of the green uh, parties and uh, the this left wing progressive parties, but also the problem of the whole uh, political system uh, these days. Um, they, uh, uh, there, there are several uh, papers in our project that were uh, looking at their uh, uh, attempts of left wing uh, progressive green movements to and parties particularly to reach out and to uh, gain support in the countryside and indeed what you write in your questions it's uh, also the true that it's mostly popular among progressive middle class urban consumers rather than uh, rural dwellers so what can we do in this case right um, in this way uh, I'd like to uh, talk again about um, food sovereignty uh, but not uh, the way how uh, i don't know green party would uh, discuss it but as a movement from below and uh, that could mobilize and engage different social groups of in a rural society in rural society and as you know it's in uh, food sovereignty is um, uh, right uh, to the people's healthy and culturally appropriate food and the right to define their own food systems. Uh, 
and it places a control over production, distribution, and consumption of food into the hands of local food producers and consumers, away for the, from the control of their multinational corporations and super, supermarket chains. Uh, in this way, uh, here also the quote uh, June Boris again, that this food sovereignty as an agrarian populist movement uh, can uh, be the potential to erode right wing populist agitation because it offers an alternative to the neoliberal agricultural mo uh, model. But again, you write in uh, your questions that. Uh, progressive uh, ideas and mantras of food sovereignty uh, is not really you know suited or fit well uh, into the peasant community of the eastern europe and uh, we did a research on that sorry so uh, indeed the legacies of communism uh, influence the societal attitude towards capitalism and socialism and uh, what uh, makes the adoption of this food sovereignty uh, anti-capitalist and pro-socialist ideology is quite problematic. Uh, it is my colleague uh, Anna Haiduen. Uh, we did uh, research on uh, uh, Eco Ruralis, it's a Romanian uh, member of La Via Campesina, the social movement uh, that promotes food sovereignty in Romania. And it faced many uh, problems in their daily activities because the majority of rural Romanians are more conser are rather conservative and concerned with the more bread and butter issues. Uh, and they not really interested in the abstract ideas of food sovereignty. Uh, we also found that the whole concept of food sovereignty is rather a little bit alien or foreign um, in the countryside of uh, post-socialist countryside. Uh, and it's perceived as uh, strange and not from there. But what's interesting, uh, we also found uh, another um, sustainable practices that are similar to food sovereignty, uh, but they were practiced for centuries uh, without uh, thinking uh, about uh, the, the alternative movement. Uh, for example, uh, we saw these uh, processes of propagation and distribution of uh, local seed varieties. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, Ecororaris is doing these days. Um, and it uh, attracts uh, many people to join the movement. And this seed distribution are, uh, is organized at the local nested markets and take into account the low income of rural population. It's similar to food sovereignty, but it's deeply rooted in the traditions of the rural communities and also uh, as you know if you have the relatives in eastern europe uh, you know that people there uh, grow the healthy and culturally appropriate food on their household clothes but without um, attracting much importance to this uh, uh, attaching much importance to this process and see it's just uh, the way how it was used to be and still goes on and they don't engage in any political discourses and mobilization around these issues. And in the paper that I have sent you to read on Ukraine, I actually was discussing there how to transform this quiet form of food sovereignty, the, for, the food sovereignty that is not associated with any political discourse and mobilization into a more loud uh, form uh, of food sovereignty. And in your Ukrainian case, we see that the, the rising patriotism and the hopes for better European future, mobilized many small-scale uh, producers to talk about their food production in a positive way and to talk it as an alternative to neoliberal large-scale agricultural uh, production. So it's very important step forward and we should build on it and to see how the more culturally appropriate practices could fit and could uh, mobilize people for uh, uh, collective action. And another problem that you also uh, mentioned in your question is there a mismatch between the progressive ideas of urban consumers and the uh, conservative position of many farmers in Eastern uh, and Central Europe. And uh, indeed, it's a big problem. And uh, there's a serious and very problematic this rural-urban divide in, in Europe, which limits coalitions between farmers and consumer movements. Uh, while urban activists, they focus on sustainability and alternative food, no food networks, you know, all these progressive things. 
uh, European farmers are more concerned with preserving their way of life and traditions and uh, getting their profits, right? Uh, so uh, even uh, what we see from the farmers' uh, protest that some farmers' discourses and practices are quite conservative and exclusionary and may support rather than undermine right-wing populism. And uh, this is this is a big thing that we have to work with uh, for uh, in the coming time for sure. Uh, but it's also there's a the need to look for the bridges. And in, uh, the example you gave me in one of uh, your questions is uh, very relevant uh, and good to illustrate my point in this way. So you were talking about the Save the Bees movement in Germany. Well, I didn't study this movement in Germany, but I came across a similar discourse in Ukraine. It's not uh, driven by uh, honey farmers, but uh, rather by the farmers who grow buckwheat. And it's buckwheat is a very popular crop in Eastern and form, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And buckwheat uh, farmers, they need bees for uh, pollinization. Without bees, there is no buckwheat. So uh, this concern among farmers is driven by the production interests, uh, not by the environmental per se, but it also meets the uh, environmental concerns of urban, urban consumers, right? So in this case, the collective action is possible. And, uh, well, and it's certainly not uh, in every situation is possible, but we need to try to find those bridges for every situation and try to look beyond some uh, universal frameworks and to see where their uh, coalitions are possible. And this is uh, coming to my final uh, uh, subtopic for this lecture is the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, I won't talk much about that because I we didn't do much research on that it's still a going on issue and we just observe and see how things uh, develop but what uh, pandemic has exposed and showed to all of us beyond those activists and scholars is that critical inequalities and unsustainability of the neoliberal agricultural model uh, it was especially visible in the beginning of the crisis when supermarket shelves were empty, uh, but at the same time farmers had to destroy tons of fresh food because they were not able to, to sell them. And the European Union um, government's uh, attempts to guarantee the food supply largely resulted in supporting the global agribusiness and supermarket chains, while the local farmers' markets were forced to close. The pandemic also um, highlighted the structural inequalities uh, generated by the neoliberal regime of labor market regulations. And uh, you probably came across the news about agricultural workers, both seasonal migrant workers and also those who work in the meat factories, for example. They are the most vulnerable to the contracting the disease. And there's a lot of uh, scandals uh, were revealed by the journalists that uh, those responsible for the production do not meet their uh, social distance requirements or, you know, people coming to work and, uh, while they're sick and many, many other things. So I think you all heard about that. But uh, what um, the pandemic demonstrated also, not only the, the bad things, right, but also uh, good things that there are uh, and there are still uh, uh, the war and there are the territory territorially embedded food systems that are not structurally dependent on global supply chains and that are resilient that are sustainable and they they could offer the alternatives to a neoliberal agriculture model and they work uh, when the government uh, priced its arms and said, we don't know what to do. Those uh, button-up initiatives took over in many cases and uh, supplied the food uh, to uh, consumers, right? So, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, this, uh, I would like to uh, mention the question, one of those questions you asked, uh, 
So you said that the food, the highly high quality food, uh, are not affordable for poor consumers in times of crisis. And indeed, absolutely, you're absolutely right that the poor people tend to choose the cheap food from large supermarket chains, chains and processed food, uh, rather than going to the organic shop and buy uh, healthy and responsible food. But uh, food shouldn't be expensive. Um, the, if we talk about certified organic food that is sold in bioecological urban boutiques, it's not food sovereignty. On the contrary, those uh, only rich and large-scale farmers are able to afford this expensive certification. And such certification schemes actually work as an instrument of exclusion, uh, mostly those little and medium farms from the food supply chain. Uh, but uh, the question is, what makes food expensive, there, good quality food expensive? Uh, it's a long supply chain. Uh, where there's now various intermediaries and supermarkets earn the most of the money. Uh, so the goal of food sovereignty movement is to make the chain as short as possible, to bring consumers and producers together as close as possible. And uh, during the corona crisis virus, uh, cr cr the coronavirus crisis, we uh, witnessed uh, two main developments. First is that the government continue to support in supermarkets and industrial agribusiness. But at the same time, there is an um, emergence uh, and strengthening of the alternative networks of food distribution. This is the uh, Facebook groups, uh, for example. There's also uh, food boxes to deliver that to homes as an initiative of small scale farmers. And there's a food sharing. And I think this is interesting uh, activity in times of uh, the pandemic. Uh, here I put a picture uh, taken by a friend of mine in a small rural town of, uh, of, in the Kaliningrad uh, Oblast. It's in the northwest of Russia. Uh, and this it's written there, you take it for free. So, um, and it's not only in Russia, it's in many uh, other countries of Eastern Europe where this food sharing tradition is uh, is common and it exists for for long for many years and this is the way how you do the food sharing uh, in a responsible way when you follow the social distancing norms and many indeed many uh, small scale and medium scale farmers they left their su surplus produce outside their farms or in the streets for people to take away and this is interesting to see uh, this And the final slide, and that what I would like to uh, tell you in the end of this lecture is um, what uh, what can you and me do as in the consumers to help to transform our food system into a more sustainable uh, system. So first is uh, reduce uh, food waste and shift uh, our diet towards a more local, ecological, and seasonal food. Uh, so second is when uh, we prepare the meals at home, we should use uh, raw and fresh ingredients rather than purchasing this uh, uh, convenient but uh, packaging heavy, highly processed, uh, pre-made food. Uh, then also uh, all of us should get our hands dirty and appreciate how difficult but also how rewarding it is to grow food and there's already a, a big and vibrant urban agriculture movement uh, and uh, the cities should support this movement and uh, help to amplify it further and also we need to do our best as a consumers to get in touch and get connected directly with local farmers and share with them the risks and rewards of growing food through community supported agriculture. Um, so let's make sure that any recovery plan also includes meaningful investment for such systems to make them even more mainstream. Let's buy more food directly from farmers who are already uh, transitioning it to the better food system. So do uh, something make you know the change starts from uh, ch change starts with you and let's uh, help the system to get better so here i would like to stop and i think i did my time limit well 
Um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.